Hi guys, welcome back to Sam Talks Cars. I hope you're all keeping well. Notice the B7 RS4 buyer's guide went down quite well, um, so I thought I'd do one for the R35 GTR. Unfortunately, I don't own the GTR anymore, but I'll uh, I'll talk more about that a little bit later on, perhaps in another, you know, perhaps in another video. But I thought I'd provide some knowledge to people that are maybe looking to get into the R35, um, because I mentioned that sort of with this lockdown, this whole COVID situation, a lot of cars now are a lot more affordable than they were perhaps, say, six months ago. Certainly when I was buying GTRs in January, there were only a couple below £30,000. Certainly in the last month, I've known nearly 10 people that have bought some for under that figure. So a lot of people have got rid. I'm not saying that's a direct reflection on the market price and what they're worth, but I'm saying that people are a lot more likely to get rid of them now. So if it's something you've considered, perhaps now is a good time to buy. But let's look at the common faults and see if you still fancy one. So I'll start with the most common, and this is the bell housing. And what does this mean? So if you approach GTR and it's on idle, if you've got the bonnet up, it may sound like a light tapping sound from the top of the engine. However, if on a right-hand drive UK example, you're stood next to the driver's door, it'll sound again like, that like a metallic tapping from underneath the vehicle. So that's always something to bear in mind. It's quite a common fault. Um, you can upgrade them to a modern bell housing. So if you've got a 2009 CBA car like I had, you could put a My17 bell housing in it. That will fix the issue short term. But unfortunately, it seems something that always comes back. There's always going to be a little bit of a sound there. It'll lessen. It'll be better than it was. But it's not necessarily a perfect replacement or a perfect fix it may happen again in the future but it's always something you want in the vehicle's history um, wheel click now this is a very very minor thing but sometimes you'll maybe turn the car on lock and hear a, a clicking sound it's really like almost like clicking a pen sort of sound um, also when you're driving along at low speeds if you've got a window open you'll hear it this is nothing to worry about um, what you'll need to do is jack the vehicle up take the wheels off and just clean the contact points of where the hub meets the wheel Something's probably in there. Something's not too happy. It's really not a big deal. It's sort of a half an hour job. Give it a clean. Check all the contact areas are clean. Nothing's trapped. And that should be that. Service history. Service history is important with any vehicle, but with a Nissan GTR, they're somewhat fussy, and you need to be very, very careful with what your vehicle has had done to it. I had a CBA car, which is obviously one of the earliest, so sort of 09 to 2011, and these were on a six-month service rotation. So every six months, it gets serviced for something. It has oil every single time. Not always oil and filter. I always did oil and filter, or I did when I serviced it. So it's probably best to do the filter for like an extra 10 quid or whatever it's going to cost to buy one. But yeah, so it tends to go oil change, and then different gearbox fluid, and then sometimes you'll have what's called an optimization service. That's what we call a clutch relearn. If you have Ecotec or Cobb, that would be when you plug it in via Bluetooth and you'll be able to do that yourself. You put the vehicle in neutral, you've got the handbrake on and you can feel it sort of lurching itself around as it learns what it wants to do. You'll have something called touch points and the values are typically zero. I think you can set them to plus two or negative two. You can, you can fiddle about with them depending how you want the vehicle to change gear. If you want a really hardcore grabby setup, I think that's in the plus two sort of range. Mine had a Litchfield clutch, so it was quite bitey, so mine was still on, on naught. I think if you're running additional power and quite a modified example on a stock clutch, you might want to set it to negative and just allow a little bit of clutch slip for a bit of mechanical sympathy. So that's always something to be mindful of. But I would encourage anyone, if their vehicle is tuned with Ecotec, to get the Bluetooth dongle. I found it really, really useful. I downloaded the app onto my iPhone. I plugged the Bluetooth thing into the, um, into the port, and I was able to read any codes if something came up, do a clutch relearn, set service indicals. I could even play about with the launch control. I could do a lot of things that would have been beneficial if I'd kept the vehicle longer term. Um, discs. So my vehicle came with Alcon brake discs. These are a big upgrade from the drilled Brembos. As I've written before with the RS4, Brembos tend to warp. The discs can crack around the holes. And they just don't seem to last as long as you'd hope. Mine came with Alcon upgrades. However, with the R35 platform, you need to be very careful with the discs. You can run your fingers up the face, as I did, and there wasn't really a lip on the front that you could see. However, on the back of the disc, they'd actually lipped on the inside. So they were wearing more on the inside than they were on the outside. 
this is a this is a common thing with GTRs, unfortunately. And unless you can get your vehicle on a ramp or take wheels off, it's quite difficult to tell unless you obviously put your hand and your fingers down the back of the disc. But again, you may not always be able to feel that. The, the J-hooks felt okay to me. I had the vehicle inspected a couple of months later and it turned out they were quite heavily worn on the inside that I couldn't see, despite the pads being meaty on both sides. So yeah, the disc will lip on the inside. You need to be mindful of that and maybe have your vehicle inspected as soon as possible. Um, if it's been to a dealership and they've had it up on a lift, ask for pictures. If it's going for a service, basically have the vehicle health checked before you pick it up because you could end up with a very, very costly bill. I think Alcons all round from Litchfield cost you somewhere between 1500 to 2000 pounds and you're obviously going to need pads as well um next it comes to sort of quality control issues as far as i'm concerned little disappointing snippets that you wouldn't expect in a vehicle that was as well engineered as an r35 gtr um i'll start at the front misting headlights my car they weren't the worst i've seen but they weren't great either in the corner right at the very top they were hazy, they were misted, and they were almost yellowed a little bit. And it, it really dated the car quite badly. I mean, it wasn't an old vehicle. It was 2009 on a 59 red, so it was barely 11, well, barely 11 years old now, never mind when I bought it. And I always found that really quite disappointing, that they were misting like that. So you can polish them with a good compound. That will rectify the issue short term. But realistically, you're going to need a uv light resistant sealant or a wax of some sort to try and protect them from doing it again in the future it took me about an hour or so to polish them out and rectify it short term but it's something that we'll likely need doing again um and bodywork I, I had a lot of issues with my car actually i was quite disappointed I, I bought it because it was mechanically solid it was well modified it'd been well looked after and it had a lot of great bits on it that i wasn't going to find without spending a lot of a lot more money but the bodywork. So the front of my car was really badly stone chipped. And I know you're going to get that when a car's got mileage on it. But I've owned Audi RS4s with more miles. And I'm talking 180,000 miles that had better bodywork and better paint on them that hadn't been repainted, hadn't been resprayed than this GTR at 75,000 miles. Honestly, the front end was absolutely battered. Um, from the centre of the grills, from the front bumper, to the wings, to the bonnet. There were stone chips everywhere. And I don't mean like a little stone chip. I mean, where they've gone straight through to the metal. It's taken all the paint off with it. And I've never seen anything like it. I don't know whether it's a GTR thing. I don't know whether it's a Japanese car thing. But I, I never saw it in any of my German cars. And I was, I was really quite disappointed with that, really. And to sort of follow on from that, we've then got aluminium corrosion. Nissan are aware of this. You can claim under warranty depending on the age of your vehicle and how many miles it's covered. However, you'll need to look on both the doors at the front. The contact patch where it meets the front wings, right at the top. Um, there'll tend to be a bubble there. It could be anything from you know a couple of millimetres to mine was about the size of my index finger and bubbling. Um, that's the main area where the door will tend to corrode. However, it will also start to go underneath the mirror and around the door handles. So effectively, the whole door really needs to be repaired. Um, Nissan tend to do localised repairs, so they'd repair the three separate areas and try and blend the paint. hope you don't notice it too bad. I spoke to Stuart Gold. Stuart Gold is a Battalion 35 member, and he runs the only GTR-approved body shop. He was going to paint both doors for me. It had been agreed under warranty, and effectively, Nissan were going to pay, I think, £505 towards the repair for the doors. I was gonna to have to pay something around 700 pounds because the entire doors were gonna be painted. Um, this is nothing against Stuart. His work is of top quality. I've seen some of the cars he's painted, it's fantastic. But for me, having a GTR worth 27, 28 grand and then spending 700 pounds to fix something Nissan should have fixed, it, it didn't sit well with me and it didn't sit well with me that I was paying more money than Nissan were. Again, I know it's not a fault of the body shop, I just didn't feel happy that Nissan were only paying £500. I'm paying seven to have it blended into the front and rear wings. That that, that frustrated me a lot. Um, now we come to something a bit more technological. So the gearbox. The gearbox in an R35 it is a work of art. Certainly for something as old as it is, it is a fantastic piece of equipment. The dual clutch is good. It's very quick when you want it to be. 
but there are a lot of drawbacks and a lot of side effects. Um, if the gearbox is anything than up to perfect running temperature, it's it's very clunky, it's very lurchy, and at times it's actually quite unpleasant. You need to allow the vehicle some time when you ask it to do things, even when it's warm. So for example, if I were to pull up outside my house and reverse on the drive, I need to be very careful how I go from drive to reverse. I almost need to give it a couple of seconds before I've actually put my foot on the throttle to start moving in reverse to go onto my drive. Because if you do it too quickly, you tend to get a horrible lurch backwards and it goes with a clunk and you genuinely think you've broken something. So that's something to be mindful of. Temperature's up around 60, 70 degrees. It's not so bad. But it also collects gears as well, which is something I found very frustrating. At something around 34 miles an hour, your vehicle will be in sixth gear. But instead of dropping down to fifth, where it would be better off, or maybe even fourth, it'll slip the clutch in sixth to stay in sixth gear. And I, I used to hate the way it did this because it felt like it was dragging the transmission. So I spent 99% of my time in manual mode to stop it doing that. Sitting in fourth gear at 35 miles an hour is perfectly fine. You're not buying a GTR for fuel economy. So realistically, it doesn't matter that much. Anyway, again with the gearbox, it's fairly common, sadly, to lose gears in the GTR. But you won't lose, say, one gear alone. You'll lose 50% of your gears. You'll either lose first, third and fifth or second, fourth and sixth. Uh, I don't know which one reverse sits with off the top of my head, but you will, you'll will you lose gears, effectively. And this is down to the clips, uh, TSB clips. Something rotates in the gear selection. However, if you take it apart, take the oil pan out, something along those lines, you can fit these TSB clips. And what they do is they hold the alignment of each gear exactly where it should be. And this will prevent you from losing gears. Um, to check your gearbox is healthy, you want to do a cold start on the vehicle. And repeatedly shift from first to reverse reverse to first and back and forth back and forth you want to make sure that the gear never flashes at you you always want it to select so if you go from reverse to first it shouldn't flash it should just go into first and it should never skip to second either because that will be a sign that you've lost first gear um, again with the gearbox early cars and this is standard cars so hopefully a mapped example will not suffer from this but it's quite common for early cars like mine, 2009, 2011, to have had multiple gearboxes. The early launch control systems, which are, let's be honest, what made the R35 GTR quite famous, um, used to pretty much tear the gearbox apart, really. I don't know what it was, but Nissan again knew it was a fault. And I think they're on revision two or three now. It's a lot smoother. You can actually use it. But back in the day, the launch control was actually tearing the gearbox apart. My car had a replacement gearbox at two years old. It then went to Litchfield another three years later for a clutch upgrade. So I think it's safe to say that the R35 isn't quite as strong as perhaps people may believe. And onto, onto cold starts again. Uh, blue smoke. Obviously turbocharged vehicles can have you know leaks in the turbos, leaks in the engine. You're looking for blue smoke on cold start. If there is any, walk away. There could be an issue with the turbo, could be an issue with the engine. It's one of those things where it's a big gamble. So just be mindful of that. You want to be behind the vehicle when it started. And then, as mentioned before, go in and check that it's happy to select gears when cold. Tracking. The R35 is a big, heavy vehicle. It's one and three quarter tons, basically, around 1,750 kilos. And because of this, it's susceptible to, to wearing tyres and brakes anyway. But if the tracking's out, you're likely to tow in and wear the inside edges of your tyres. Easy way to check this, to obviously lock the steering wheel over to one side and check the insides of the tyres, make sure they're not wearing very heavily. Quite common for this, obviously if you've got an early car like mine, you can have the, you can have the tracking check twice a year or every 6,000 miles, whichever comes first, but it should be serviced every six months. So hopefully if it does start to go out of alignment, you should catch it early enough before it kills a thousand pounds of tyres. Um, again, when starting up the vehicle, every now and then from the back, you may hear a clicking sound um, Vodafone back in the day used to run the tracking systems for the cars so if they were stolen you'd, you'd know where they were obviously people are now not using a subscription the cars are 10, 11, 12 years old now so if you go to Litchfield they can code this out for you and rectify the issue but if you ever hear a weird sort of clicking noise that's, that's probably what that is and into the interior the dashboard LEDs tend to fail quite common on early cars so a lot of vehicles had replacement clocks or dashboard clusters under warranty. 
So sometimes you'll see cars with mileage discrepancies because of the fact that it's had to go back to Litchfield, uh, back to Litchfield perhaps, or Nissan and have new clocks fitted. However, if it's done at Nissan, Nissan will only ever reset the odometer to zero. So unfortunately, it, it can mess the value of your car up if, say, it goes from 40,000 miles back down to zero. It always puts a red flag on MOT checks, and it's a very difficult thing to explain. So yeah, LEDs can fail. And, and there's another few things as well, is the early cars sometimes used to have navigation failure. So if you managed to get a car with sat-nav, sometimes it would fail. You'd end up with a blue screen on cold start and wait for it to warm up, and then it eventually start to work. It was touchscreen, so again, you need to be quite careful with it. Make sure you don't damage it. 